All right. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Savage Joy, the Unruly Hour. Today, I am joined with Lisa Savage, no relation um, of Maine. Uh, she is running independent. Um, and uh, I've had a request for her from a number of viewers. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so as a proud independent, I'm always excited to interview others. Um, why run independent and not Democrat? It's a great question. Um, I would not run Democrat under any circumstances because I'm not going to take money from corporations and do what they say. However, I did start out as a Green Party candidate. I was a member of the Green, Maine Green Independent Party, and I could not get ballot access in Maine under the rules for third parties because Democrats and Republicans wrote those rules. So when it became evident that we weren't going to make it, I unenrolled and uh, applied for ballot access as an independent. It took us one day, Super Tuesday, we got over 9,000 signatures. We only needed 4,000 to get on the ballot. And so that's why I'm running independent. That is incredible. I am in Pennsylvania and they just had breaking news today that Greens were kicked off the ballot in our state. I am so pissed off. <laughs> I mean, I interviewed Angela Walker. I love her so much. I don't even have the choice to vote for her now. And it, it's so disgusting and frustrating. Um, and I don't think the Dems realize that that not only is not going to give Joe any more votes, it's actually going to hurt down ballots um, as well. Um, it's just so frustrating. I'm like seething all morning. Same thing in Wisconsin. Yes. Right? Absolutely. Democratic Party kept the Greens off the ballot there. Yep. And I, I expect that with more states, especially us swing states. Um, it's, they don't understand it's not going to be advantageous whatsoever for them. Um, now, you do have ranked choice voting. Um, I interviewed uh, Levi Tillman, I believe his name was, in 2018 from Maine, um, and he was ranked choice. He said it, he felt it was advantageous for progressives. Do you agree? Oh, definitely. Um, ranked choice voting eliminates the spoiler effect. So the fear that you might, in my case, um, uh, throw the election to the incumbent Susan Collins by voting for me is eliminated because in a rank, the way ranked choice w voting works in Maine, um, the, you know, if somebody ranks me first, they're very unlikely to rank Collins second. If somebody ranks the Democrat first, they're very unlikely to rank Collins second. There is another independent in this race. He's to the right of Susan Collins. Um, but essentially, a strong progressive in the race, such as myself, increases the chance of unseating an unpopular uh, conservative incumbent because voters will come out to vote that wouldn't have necessarily come out. Um, that may be less of a factor in a presidential year, but um, exit polls uh, at Jill Stein elections have shown for years that people go, I came out to vote for Jill Stein. I wouldn't have come out to vote for the two corporate party candidates. And then, um, you know, another way to describe our ranked choice voting system is instant runoff, because what happens is um, it means that you must have a majority of the votes to win. So if someone gets 50% plus one vote in the first round, then that the election's over and they won. Um, but if no one gets 50%, which is quite likely in this race, they look at who polled, the, uh, who got the fewest number of votes, that person is eliminated, that candidate's out of the race, and then they look at people that picked that candidate first, who did they pick second, and they transfer the votes to those other candidates. Now does anybody have 50%? Yes, election over, no. Uh, go through another round of that. We saw this happen in the second district of Maine, second congressional district, that's where I live, when we eliminated Bruce Poliquin, a very unpopular GOP incumbent, with a relatively young newcomer uh, Democrat, Jared Golden, because there were two uh, independents in the race whose number two and number three choices mostly went to Golden. So Poliquin was ahead in the first round of counting,
That's amazing. So now you are running against Susan Collins, who's essentially a Republican in, in every single way. Um, and then the other independent, and are is it just the three of you? No, there's a Democrat, very centrist, corporate Democrat. Uh, she's Speaker of the Main House. Her name's Sarah Gideon. Uh, she right. was the Democratic Party's pick. There were two progressives in the primary who uh, many of the young people that support my campaign favored. And when they did not win the primary, one of them, Bree Kidman, endorsed our campaign saying, Lisa is the candidate that stands for Medicare for All and a Green New Deal. So I'm uh, going to endorse Lisa. And um, so uh, our, our, the corporate Democrat doesn't support Medicare for All, doesn't support a demilitarized Green New Deal. And um, in a pandemic, I'm the only candidate in a four-way race that supports single-payer universal health care. Don't you find that kind of incredible? I do. It's absolutely abhorrent. And, you know, we're seeing that with Biden as well. Um, he said he'd veto it. Um, now, I personally think Biden's going to lose. But one thing that he could kind of guarantee he would win is if he said he'd fight for Medicare for all. Um, a lot of people would vote for him then, and he's not even trying, so we're seeing that with so many Dems. Um, as far as the, the pandemic goes, how is Susan Collins handling your district? Are, you know, are people pleased um, with the way it's being handled? Not for the most part. Most, most voters in Maine are fairly are Democrats and, and fairly um, centrist or, or leftist. Uh, a few, you know, there are a lot of Trump supporters up in Northern Maine. That's really where so Susan Collins is from, for Northern Maine. Um, you see a lot of Trump signs. You don't see a lot of mask wearing. Um, people have politicized a microbe. I mean, there've been a lot of things in 2020 that I didn't see coming, but that was one of them. It's epidemiology. People, it's not political. The COVID-19 virus does not care what party you're in. Um, but there's a lot of uh, resistance to mask wearing. I don't know if you've been following. We had this wedding. So we have this like Southern preacher who came to Maine and started founding all these churches and collecting money and flying around in his airplane. And he held a wedding, uh, the reception of which was in violation of our COVID-19 uh, rules. People weren't masked. There were more than 50 people indoors. We've now had seven deaths as a result of that wedding, not from people who attended the wedding, people who caught the virus, from people who caught the virus, from people who attended the wedding. It's still spreading. The pastor's church, you know, one of his churches in Sanford, same thing. There's video of them holding choir practice with underage people, no masks. That's one of the most dangerous things that are known, right, is singing in a closed space. Um, but I don't think that most voters are focused on Susan Collins' um, COVID-19 policies. If they don't like the way it's been handled at the federal level, they're mad at her. But they were already really mad at her over uh, the fact that she wouldn't um, vote to convict in the impeachment trials. She, she supported the bad tax bill that robbed from the poor to give to the already wealthy. And uh, postal workers have been mad at her since 2006 because she was one of the sponsors of that bill that undercut the financial stability of the post office by forcing them to fund retirees' health benefits, like out 75 years or some ridiculous requirement that only applied to them. But most people would cite her support for Brett Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court as the, you know, the line she crossed and they're never coming back. Absolutely. That's what I thought of immediately when I think of her name. Um, so it's your your page says that you've been, a, you know, an activist and organizer for several decades. Why run now? It's a good question, really, because of ranked choice voting. Um, I was just about to do my last year of teaching. I taught for 25 years in Central Maine. I had helped write a school improvement grant, like a federal grant from my very, very low income school. And I had the, it created a reading specialist position that I was in. And I had said, I'll work to the end of that grant and then I'll retire. But last summer, um, I was approached by some elders of the Green Party saying, we need a strong candidate to run because of Susan Collins being so unpopular, because of ranked choice voting, um, we really feel like this is going to be a marquee, um, you know, race this year. Would you consider it? And I had a chance to talk. I have three grown 
uh, children and my sister was visiting from California and my uncle was visiting from Australia and all of them said, this is perfect, you should do this. My oldest son said, I was worried about what you were gonna do when you retired mom, because you always have to stay busy. But he also said to his siblings, ask not what mom can do for you, rather ask what you can do for mom's campaign. So <laughs> our comms director jokes around that the other candidates are backed by big money and I'm backed by big family. Um, <laughs> we have actually done pretty well on fundraising for a campaign that refuses any corporate donations, corporate lobbyist donations the PACs that launder corporate money so candidates can claim they're not taking it while still taking it. But we've raised $130,000 in wow. over the course of a year, which is more than any green campaign in Maine ever had before. We've raised $10,000 just since the first debate, which was Friday night. Um, so uh, ranked choice voting really made me realize, okay, besides the fact that it's a bully pulpit, because I'm a communications person and have done a lot of sort of citizen journalism and um, being the press agent for the anti-war um, and conversion movement here in Maine for years. But I realized, okay, it is a good way to get the word out about some of these policies I care about. And, you know, we're kind of in an emergency. I agreed before the pandemic. Now we have a healthcare emergency on top of climate emergency. The skies here in Maine are uh, darkened by the smoke from the West Coast fires last couple days. And it's supposed wow. to get darker and darker until Tuesday. You know, that's like 3,000 miles, right? Yeah. So I always feel like young people are looking at my generation going, what part of emergency do you not understand? And then Democrats are saying things like, oh, we'll be carbon neutral by 2050. That's 30 years from now. I don't mm -hmm. think we have 30 years. So that's yes. a big motivation. You know, before the pandemic emergency, the uh, families of the students I was working with in the... Um, second district where I live were barely making it financially. Even if they had work and transportation to get there, they were like one illness, one accident away from the collapse of their household um, economy. And I just think that's unfair. Um, people in Maine tend to work hard, take care of their families, help their neighbors. Even if I don't agree with them politically on every single thing, um, you know, they deserve to have a decent quality of life. Instead, we have CEOs making $20 million a year before bonus, but average workers, you know, real wages have been flat for decades now. So I'm motivated to, you know, try and do something about that problem. And do you feel that people have been receptive when you're phone banking, things like that? They actually have. Real voters are quite receptive. For one thing, Maine has a strong uh, um, history of voting for independent candidates. Our other Senator, Angus King, is an independent. He was governor of our state twice as an independent. And many people say, when they hear me say, I'm an independent and I'm on the ballot, that's enough for them. They grab the palm card out of my hand and say, great, we need you know independents standing up to the uh, those two party system. The other thing that's happened is that the two corporate candidates have raised, I think at this point, $60 million out of state. They're on track to raise a hundred million and they have barraged the public with uh, very negative advertising attack ads aimed at each other all summer long. So lots of voters say, I am so sick of those ads. I never want to see their faces again. I am voting for you. I've had it with them. Uh, in the debate on Friday night, the moderator for NBC um, called, said, it's just wallpaper at this point referring to this relentless barrage of advertising. Also, most of those advertising dollars have been spent outside Maine. My campaign has done some advertising along the way. We've mostly spent the funds we've raised on staff, um, but we have an, a radio campaign running now. We just started running our first 30 second TV ad about Medicare for All, and we've been doing online um, print you know, uh, Maine publications, digital advertising. We would rather spend the money here in Maine to keep our media outlets alive uh, a little longer than almost all the spending that uh, the Democrat and Republican have done has been like, you know, making Silicon Valley billionaires even richer. Um, and I don't think- Which is so crazy because they can't vote for you guys. I don't understand that. 
Well, a 12 year old whose dad was talking to me at the Lewiston Farmer's Market last weekend said, oh, those ads, I just, they're on YouTube. I just want to watch my vids and I had to learn a new word. I said, really? What word did you learn? You know, as a teacher, I was interested in that. He said, hypocrisy. <laughs> so true. Speaking of the debate, uh, you know, the, a few of the people who were excited you're coming on were, wanted me to really talk about the debate. If there were no ranked choice voting, isn't it likely you wouldn't have been at the debate? Yes, very likely. I do have a great team um, and they work hard to advocate for us. We've had a series of petitions, mostly on issues such as Medicare for All, but we put up a t petition uh, uh, urging the supporters to sign it and share it saying, uh, you know, let Lisa debate. We want to hear Lisa debate. And we got a thousand signatures on that in a matter of, I think, three days. So we shared that with the media outlets. This first debate was um, a cooperative venture between the local NBC affiliate, uh, New Center, Maine, the Bangor Daily News, which is a big uh, city daily, and the Portland Press Herald, which is the other big city daily. It's unusual for them to team up. I don't know if it was because of the pandemic. There was no live audience. We were in a hotel ballroom, but you know, it was basically just the, um, the journalists and the candidates. And um, the other independent candidate is kind of a, a loose cannon on deck, to put it mildly. And um, so he put on quite a show and, and got a lot of the um, media attention afterwards because he refused to answer the questions and, and basically just clowned around a lot. But uh, most of the feedback we've received from the debate was like, wow. Lisa was the only person who answered the questions because the two corporate candidates uh, recite the only adult on the stage. Um, so I think actually that the other independent kind of made me look good by contrast. And people were also said, weren't you distracted because I happened to be right next to him, you know, so we were like six feet apart. And he was pretty, uh, you know, expressive. But I said, you know, I taught high school for a lot of years. You think I've ever had Max Lynn in my class? You know? uh, <laughs> well, so Susan Collins did not uh, participate? Oh, yeah, she did. Oh, she um, did. Susan Collins, Susan Collins and Sarah Gideon both participated, um, and they acted, you know, like uh, you would expect them to act. They recited their talking points. They, um, I think they, again, um, got bad points from the audience for attacking each other. In Maine, we're nice. We don't attack people. It's not, um, it's just a more polite kind of culture, you know? And um, I don't think that that played well, but I do have to say that Susan Collins did me a big favor. Twice she referred to me my name and said, I agree with Lisa. Once it was over social security funding and I can't remember what the other topic was. Um, I interpreted it as yet another dig at the Democrat, but I'll take anybody's number two rankings. If I can get some of Susan Collins followers going, okay, I'm ranking, Collins first, because I've always voted for her. She's the incumbent now. Okay, I hate the Democrat. Oh, that the clown independent. I'm not giving him my vote. Plus, he's directly challenging Collins. So many of her supporters will not appreciate that. They might give me their number two. Many, many Democrats will give me their number two because I'm the closest to, you know, the that candidate. And I think that many of um, the independents that rank Max Lynn first will rank me second because I have the word independent next to my name. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting because I've, I've interviewed almost 200 progressive candidates since 2018. And this is, I believe, the first time that an incumbent has actually agreed to debate <laughs> the progressive. That never happens, ever. Mm, um, right. And we're seeing it with Pelosi and, and everyone else. They just, they fear them. Um, so that's interesting. And, you know, holding your own definitely, you know, is going to be advantageous to you. Um, so you have... Um, uh, let's see, what was the process? I know you said that being uh, green to that process, as it is in many states, um, was very, you know, difficult to get on the ballot. 
what is the, the actual process to get independence on the ballot? Is there a fee as well? Uh, no, um, it's a good question. So to get on as a member of a party, I had to collect the same number of signatures as the Democrats and Republicans did, 2,000 signatures from only registered voters of my party. And you couldn't start collecting until January 1st. So we had like a New Year's Eve party and at the stroke of midnight, we started signing the petitions, but you had to be finished by March 15th. Um, that's ice storm season in Maine from January to March 15th, bad weather. Um, Maine had 43,000 registered greens, but they're dispersed all over. You know, Maine doesn't have much population, but it's big geographically speaking. And um, many of the greens we found said, ah, I was registered green, but now I'm registered Dem because I want to vote for Bernie in the primary because we had a Super Tuesday primary this year, which we don't normally have. So as we got toward the end of February and realized we had put in 900 hours in the field and we only had 900 signatures to show for it, uh, we, our ballot access coordinator was like, you know, I hate to say it, Lisa, but you're going to have to unenroll. So I did. We applied for ballot access as an independent, which allowed us until June 15th to collect the signatures. We had to collect twice as many of them, so 4,000 instead of 2,000, but we could collect them from any registered voter. So um, our ballot access coordinator said, I think we can get them all on Super Tuesday. And we were like, come on, you know, that's not going to happen. He was like, no. We'll go to the top polling places. We'll have volunteers stand outside the polls and we'll just ask anyone emerging by definition as a, you know, a registered voter for the most part. So we did collect over 9,000 signatures that day. Then the pandemic hit. So luckily we didn't have to go out and canvas anymore because we couldn't. And then it took a long time to get the petitions back from some of the town clerks because for instance, Portland's city hall, Portland, Maine, our biggest city had shut down very early on because there were uh, cases of the virus around there. We didn't, we, we got on the ballot without a single signature from Maine's largest city. We ended up turning in 5,000 and change um, and just deciding let's not wait for Portland. We, we don't know when we'll ever get those. So um, it's an interesting process. Many people have said that it would be much more equitable if parties only had to um, collect a percentage of their registered voters. You know, so if the if the Dems had to collect a you know per, the same percentage that two thousand represents for the Greens, they would have to get I don't know something like fifteen or eighteen thousand signatures. Um, but since Democrats and Republicans are mostly in power in the um, state legislature, and that's who makes those rules, I don't know if we're going to see a change anytime soon. Absolutely, and we definitely need. Um, open primaries, damn it. <laughs> you guys are, you know, we're closed in Pennsylvania too. And having a registered Dem just to vote for Bernie is so frustrating. And that's what mm -hmm. so many people went through. And then the day after we vote, we take five showers and they, you know, go right back to independent or green. Um, mm -hmm. but I digress. Um, so you, you do uh, support the Green New Deal. Um, you have also um, jobs as a right. Um, are, is that um, in, uh, I don't see the words federal jobs guarantee. Is Do you support that specifically? Hmm, a federal jobs guarantee? Well, the, the jobs as a right is kind of part of our um, demilitarized Green New Deal program. Part of my background is I was a, um, a negotiator for the teachers local bargaining unit. You know, I've been a union vice president and a negotiator. And so uh, labor and, you know, good, not only good wages, but benefits and good working conditions are, are near and dear to my heart. Under our uh, demilitarized Green New Deal program, I've been part of a coalition for years pushing to for conversion of Maine's industrial capacity, which mostly makes weapons like everyone else's industrial capacity in the US these days, um, which is terrible for climate. The Pentagon is driving climate crisis, but no one wants to talk about that, how big their greenhouse gas emissions footprint is, how much fossil fuels they um, consume. And so if we would stop building weapon systems here, that would be one win for climate. Then if we instead built things to mitigate the effects of climate crisis, like a light rail system so we could get out of our cars, Maine really has no public transportation, except locally in a couple cities, um, or clean energy systems that could, you know, solar, wind, tidal, uh, thermal, 
systems that would you know address our energy needs that would be a second win for climate but you know the new deal part of that uh, phrase means creating jobs using federal funding uh, to address infrastructure needs and we're in uh, probably the biggest depression since the great depression right now it looks like it's going to last a while um, people often accuse me of wanting to throw people out of work at Bath Ironworks. Nothing is further from the truth. I want a just transition where people not only remain employed, but additional people are employed. Um, Economist Research, there's an outfit at the UMass Amherst that um, builds models looking at when you invest a billion dollars in a diff different sectors of the economy, how many jobs does that generate? And they mean real, good, full benefit jobs you can live on. And their research has showed uh, many years running that building weapon systems is actually a pretty poor job generation program. It doesn't actually create as many jobs as the exact same dollar investment in uh, building clean energy systems or investing in education or healthcare would. So uh, according to that research, we would get 50% additional good union jobs if we were to you know, convert to doing that. And again, people will be like, oh, that's so hard. That can't happen. Well, they've built lots of things at Bath Iron Works over the years. And in fact, since the pandemic hit, they built the machines that make the nasal testing swabs that are used to see if you have COVID-19 or not. One of the only two places in the world making them at the beginning of all this was in Maine. And um, Maine's, uh, you know, federal leaders contacted that outfit and said, could you double production? And they said, if we had more machines, we could. So they contacted Bath Ironworks and said, hey, we have Defense Production Act money, you know, federal funding. Could you build these machines uh, for that company? And of course, you know, with the, if you've got a fat federal contract, who's going to say no to that? Within four to five weeks, they had delivered the machines. So where there's a will, there's a way. And where there's federal funding, there's usually a will. Um, I don't really buy arguments that we don't have the money to do these things. Yes, we do. We just have bad budget priorities. Absolutely. A another thing about federal job guarantee or any kind of job guarantee is people who were formerly incarcerated, people who are disabled, anyone who wants a job can have a job and get training. Like right now, if you work in coal or whatever, you may lose your job, whereas a, a job guarantee you you get a new job. It may not be what you were doing, but you get one and you have that income. Now more than ever, we're seeing millions of people lose their jobs and go homeless. Um, and I know you do have homelessness on your platform as well. Is that something that's very prevalent in, in your area? Yes. Um, one almost one in four people that uh, workers in Maine lost their jobs from the pandemic. So one in you know one in four people that were employed no longer employed, and most of them lost their health care too. Um, once you're not earning and you can't afford health care, it's a short um, journey to not being able to pay the rent. We did have a rent freeze um, in here in the state as well as uh, federally, uh, and also an eviction freeze. But those things have now ended and people still aren't fully employed. Um, Portland, Maine has a huge homelessness problem. Um, it's gotten dramatically worse since the pandemic. I don't know about you, but I thought it was particularly cruel at the beginning of the pandemic. We were all just told, if you can, just stay home. But no one addressed the fact that those people are unhoused. They don't have homes. So um, you would think that there would be a big push to house them. Um, public entities have done little to address that. There is a, a nonprofit, Preble Street, that works with the um, people experiencing homelessness. But they had to shut some of their facilities because they couldn't maintain the social distancing that was required. Um, and, uh, and then they applied for permits to you know, uh, use other spaces. And the city dra is dragging its feet on issuing those permits. So the crisis has gotten dramatically worse in Portland. Um, and there's only one other uh, place with a homeless shelter in the whole state. So I think that, uh, you know, Portland is a city that's gentrifying rapidly. Developers basically call the shots and run the city government. Um, 
And I think they're just hoping that if they don't provide services, it'll be painful in the short term, but eventually in the long term, the people experiencing homelessness will go somewhere else. How realistic is that? Um, do they really have the resources to do that? So um, a jobs guarantee for those who want to work, I think is a great idea. I've been a teacher for 25 years. I just retired and I used to joke around and say, I know how to fix 90% of the problems in public education. Um, you should just double the staffing. Every single position in public education is asked to do more than one person could possibly do. So just hire twice as many teachers, ed techs, custodians, secretaries, bus drivers, you know. Um, people laugh at me because again, they think that there's no money for those things. There's always plenty of money for wars, but if you wanna take care of people or invest in education, suddenly, you know, how are we going to pay for it? Um, right now, teachers are going back scared, terrified is a word that I'm hearing them use. Um, and the physical plants that they're in have bad air quality, bad circulation. They're not big enough to achieve social distancing. And um, honestly, <laughs> I am an internet refugee. Right now I'm speaking to you from Bath, Maine. It's in Southern Maine. Um, I live in Solon in the second district, Western Maine. There isn't enough internet connectivity there to conduct a US Senate campaign. I tried and it, I just couldn't do it. So, um, you know, internet connectivity for st students going, okay, we'll do distance learning or we'll do hybrid. Well, they don't have internet at home. They don't even, there's a, some towns in Maine, you can't get internet at home or cell phone service. Um, it's part of the Green New Deal that I favor would be making those public utilities. I think the internet should be consumer owned and operated utility, Electric, electricity, same thing, water, same thing. Our water districts and our um, uh, central main power is owned by Iberdrola in Spain. And one of the most unpopular projects that's proposed right now that I've came out against early is that they want to cut uh, like a 57 mile swath through the main woods to run a power line from Hydro Quebec to Massachusetts to sell them what's being touted as clean hydropower. It's, it's the opposite of clean because they've flooded areas the size of Vermont with 14 inches of water destroying the indigenous way of life in those areas. Um, but you know, when you have corporations putting politicians into your state legislature or into Congress, then you get laws that benefit those who profit and the people are left saying, where is my representation in government? So that's my big motivation to run right there. Absolutely. Um, we're going to kind of, you know, uh, digress a bit, but um, you know, there's a lot of talk about immigration right now, Im understandably, ICE. Um, do you support abolishing ICE? I definitely support abolishing ICE. The Department of Homeland Security and ICE are both, um, you know, bad outcomes of the uh, unfortunate events of 9-11. Um, we got along fine without them before, and I'm sure we could get along fine without them now. Maine is actually um, a kind of a destination state for immigration because we've been an asylum state for many years. And I was pretty proud of, not this summer, but the summer before, there are a lot of um, people coming from um, the Democratic Republic of Congo and they're, they're crossing over to South or Central America and then making their way northward and crossing the border, um, maybe in Texas or Arizona. And what uh, the Border Patrol there was doing was putting them on a Greyhound bus and sending them to Portland, Maine, you know, three or three, 3,500 miles away, knowing that Portland, Maine is an uh, asylum seekers, you know, city. And I was so proud of the city of Portland for they rallied together public and private resources. They housed everyone. They met their needs for, uh, you know, translators and paperwork and, and food and getting the kids enrolled in school. Um, so we have a lot of, uh, they're usually called new Mainers. There've been waves of immigration from different parts of the world to Maine over the years. Um, it helps us a lot. Demographically, we're way too white and we're way too old. Young people leave Maine because you come out of school with thousands of dollars of student debt. There aren't any jobs in Maine that can pay, you know, uh, you could be paying that kind of debt service. So 
I have uh, three grown children and only one of them lives in Maine and, and he's headed out soon because the job opportunities just aren't here. But new Mainers come, they often are professionals who were engineers or doctors or something in the country that they're immigrating from. They're fleeing war or uh, other kinds of violence. And when they get here, they can't work in their field. But every single immigrant that I've talked to for years now, where I say, you know, why, why did you come here? They say, so my children could get a good education, you know? So, I, so my children would survive and, you know, get a good education. Those are the kind of citizens that you want, right? You want people like that in your state. Um, also, a lot of them, particularly the Somalis, are farmers where they uh, traditionally lived. And now in Maine, they are acquiring access to farmland and forming collectives to uh, practice sustainable uh, agriculture. Um, regenerative agriculture is the other part of a demilitarized Green New Deal, you know, which means engaging in farming practices that make the soil better, not depleting it and not using toxins and uh, things that are harmful. So I think, and, and another thing, when people were talking about, you know, when Trump came to office, he was like, we're going to get rid of all the immigrants. My husband and I looked at each other and said, who will our doctors be then? Because like my husband's specialist is a doctor, is an immigrant, my specialist is an immigrant. Um, we don't have a whole lot of health care per capita in Maine, especially in rural parts of Maine. And we often receive that care from people who've immigrated here. So, you know, also, let's just not leave this subject without saying, would we really have food in the grocery store if the farm workers that are that immigrate from south of the border and are still working in the fields in California in the smoke, in the heat wave, to put food on our tables? You know, we should be blessing those people, not um, deporting them. Absolutely. Um, you also have. Um... In, in addition to, to, you mentioned schooling, you, you do have free uh, pre-K through college um, and you do want to abolish student debt. I think that we need to make the banks that wrote those, that sponsored the uh, Congress people who wrote those bad laws that um, people are coming. I mean, I incurred a little bit of debt for both my undergrad and graduate education, but it was a reasonable amount that could be paid back working in the field. Nowadays, people come out of community college in Maine with thousands of dollars of debt. They come out of our University of Maine state system with tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. I don't see any reason for that. Other wealthy, wealthy countries invest in the education of young people that want to pursue that because we need doctors, engineers, and teachers. Also, um, the banksters can well afford to forgive the student debt that's out there now. Who wrote the law that said, even if you declare bankruptcy, you can't get out from under debt that you signed on to probably when you were still a teenager? What kind of a law is that? Um, Joe Biden, I, I, actually. Exactly. <laughs> it was. It was. Like, that's what's incredible. He is literally the reason um, why you can't write it off with bankruptcy, which is just Absolutely. And why aren't young people Perfect. excited about voting for him? I don't understand. Um, so I think it's depressing our economy tremendously. The young people that I know are working two or even three jobs just to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table and do just do the debt service, just pay the interest on their student loans. Yeah. You know, at their age, people of my generation were building a house, starting a business, having a family. Um, Keeping people from participating in the economy uh, is not good for the economy. The, the people that are hoarding wealth are, are not boosting the economy. There's no trickle da trickling down happening. Um, give the money to the people that would spend it, you know, that would buy a house or buy a farm or something. Absolutely. Um, you know, <laughs> Buddha forbid something like this would ever happen again, but let's say that a pandemic happened when we had Medicare for all, we had student debt forgiveness, we had all of these things. Can you even fathom what that would mean to the people who are now going homeless and, and things like that from, uh, you know, from the pandemic?
Sorry guys, not sure what happened. Hoping she joins in a second. My apologies. Um, she was just saying how the internet in Maine isn't like the best. Really enjoying talking to her. She's pretty amazing. I definitely recommend voting for her if you can. Plus rank choice. Mainers are definitely uh, fortunate as far as that goes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can there you, you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about oh, that. Not sure what my, the heck. My happened. housemates, my housemates' connection went down at the same time. I rebooted the modem. Hopefully. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we are um, back again. That is no problem. This is why it's good to record sometimes instead of going live. <laughs> um, I do actually uh, want to also talk about criminal justice because um, right mm -hmm. now that's, you know, on everybody's minds, understandably. Um, you do have that on your platform. Of course, it's a, it's a broad subject, um, but what are some of the things in criminal justice that you would like to, um, you know, change as far as the way Maine um, is, is taking care of things right now? Sure, that's a great question. We have the same racial disparities in our arrest and incarceration rates as everyone else does. Um, black people and people of color don't commit crimes at any higher of a rate than white people. They just don't get away with it as much. So um, our prison population is, you know, uh, way disproportionately people of color. And um, we don't have as much police violence against people of color or, or white people. Um, it's a little bit more of a, you know, it's not a super high crime um, situation in Maine generally. And uh, there of course are Black Lives Matter uh, protests here in Maine. Recently, uh, Black Lives Matter Portland had organized a, um, a, a Saturday like rally and march around, I think it was around George Floyd. Um, but in any case, a lot of uh, white supremacists began threatening the organizers and making threats of violence and the, they were going to show up with guns. And in the end, I thought wisely, the mostly young, mostly BIPOC organizers said, this is just too dangerous. We're not going to hold it. Um, there was another affinity group of uh, mostly white young people that met anyway. A few of the troublemakers showed up. This is an open carry state, so they can, you know, wave their guns around. But um, in Maine, I think that uh, poverty has, you know, um, been a big factor in why our uh, COVID infection rate is way disproportionately high for Black people. Um, we have basically two distinct groups of Black people in Maine. There are the new Mainers, the immigrants that were, you know, our Africans that came here. Um, and then there are the descendants of the enslaved Africans that um, were brought here many generations ago. And their economies are different, their needs are different, their cultures are certainly quite different. But in both cases, the infection rate of COVID-19 has been extremely high. Uh, for that group, and it's, uh, it's I think it's two effects of poverty. One is unequal access to health care means that underlying conditions such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease are already present, and that makes the infections more dangerous. And then also many of the service jobs that must be done in person and that cannot be done from home are uh, you know, um, disproportionately people of color. And so they're more on the front lines um, working in places where they would come in contact with the virus. Um, many, many uh, young people complain of racism 
in our schools. I was a civil rights team advisor for many years in Maine schools. And even though my school was largely white, um, I heard a lot of, of the uh, few students of color or uh, more often native students up where I live um, complaining that they're constantly being harassed, hearing um, derogatory language. And um, the, I watched a video, or actually it was a Zoom call of some young people, high school age, that were um, being interviewed about their experiences in Maine schools. And um, really shockingly and sadly, they complained more about the faculty than about the other students. If they were targeted for uh, you know, racist um, or microaggressions, they felt that it was teachers that uh, had done it more than their fellow students, which was really, really sad to me. So obviously a great deal of professional development in our schools needs to happen around this. Um, Absolutely. Um, is there anything else you would like to, to share? Um, something you want the, the viewers to take away so they share your campaign, vote for you, anything like that that you want them to take away? Sure. Well, uh, we didn't talk about defunding the police. It was one of the gotcha questions in the debate. And uh, it's the answer that I've got the most points from other people on saying that was your best answer. I said, as a public school teacher, I've been defunded many times, but I still went ahead and did my job. Um, I think that um, funding uh, community workers, uh, community mental health crisis workers, social workers, community dispute resolution experts, those are the people we should be sending into many of the situations where we're sending a heavily armed uh, man who's, uh, they claim they're scared, you know, I, I tend to feel like too, if police are that scared that they have to shoot an unarmed person who's done nothing violent or, you know, then they're probably in the wrong line of work. But um, we're in it to win it. We're not just trying to move the conversation left here in Maine. It's ranked choice voting. The first poll that asked about us, we got 5% of the first rankings, but 33% of the second rankings, the most of any candidate in the race. So it's entirely possible that Maine will again elect an independent. And um, if people want to visit our website, it's Lisa for Maine, spelled out F-O-R, like the sign, M-A-I-N-E dot org. We have volunteers from all over the country. So if you'd like to join in and help us out with things that can be done remotely, we'd appreciate that. Um, we've, we've raised a lot of money for a grassroots campaign, one that doesn't take corporate donations. We've raised $130,000 over the course of a little more than a year now. And since the debate on Friday, donations really poured in. So I think people are pretty excited for this, not only to unseat Susan Collins, but to show what ranked choice voting can do this is being really seen as kind of a test case. And so um, we appreciate everyone's support and, and thanks for having me on today. Absolutely, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, you guys check out uh, Lisa Savage's website, her Twitter, um, and definitely recommend her to people in Maine. Um, next week, I have Farron Cousins on. Um, he's incredible. Um, and um, our books have been sent out. Um, all of our pre-orders have been sent out and uh, we're taking new orders now, savageandpat.com for our parody book. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming on, Lisa. I wish you the best of luck with everything. I wish I could vote for you myself. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.